before we move to greeting, here is uh, a few basic problems, essentially review of the stuff that you did uh, in previous courses. So, how to solve this one? So, um, you are given an array of integers, right? And uh, uh, you have to, so this is uh, uh, x1, x2, uh, up to xn, and you have to see in time n squared log n if uh, there are four distinct integers x, y, and z, so that uh, x squared plus y squared equals uh, u squared plus v squared. So uh, four distinct integers, uh, four distinct uh, elements uh, of array in the array such that uh, this is uh, this holds. Uh, and, uh, but in time n squared log n, what time would the uh, brute force argument uh, run in? If you've just tried all quadruples, what's the complexity? And to the fourth. But you have to do it in time of n squared log n, so tiny little bit worse than half of the degree. How would you solve this problem? That is also from one of the past uh, meters. Uh, what can you do in n squared log n time? and see what they equal to. Exactly. So, so the matching. Very good, very good. So what you would do, you would form all distinct pairs. So you simply let x and y, uh, x not equal to y, and you simply compute what x squared plus y squared, right? Then you, how many elements you have? You have n squared many elements. And what do we do next? We simply sort the array of the sums of the squares. How much time does it take to sort? Well, it's n squared times log n squared. But what is that? This is n squared times uh, 2 log n. So you are within the time bound. And then, once you sort the array, what do you have to check, simply? Whether there are any duplicates, right? Because this will happen just in case you hit the same value uh, twice. Right? So it's really quite simple. OK, here is another one. So you have an array. And you have to answer in time n log n the following question. Uh, so the array is of integers, and you have to answer the question whether uh, there are x and y uh, such that uh, x to the fourth minus y to the sixth is equal x squared y squared plus 10. How would you solve this problem? Well, you, the time limit is n log n. No? So do we know the solution of the equation? No. Why it's well, this is, OK, if you really, how about x to the 40, y to the 60, x to the 20, y to the 20, now go solve this. <laughs> How would you do it? Huh? Is it two arrays in this case? Or just one? Uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, uh, either two arrays or one array, uh, and finding both from the same array doesn't make a 
difference. So it can be either uh, that x belongs to one of them and y belongs to another one or both of them in the same array. So notice that this is equivalent to x to the 40 equals y to the 60 uh, plus x to the 20, y to the 20 plus 10. Okay? So now I can arrange with x through all values and uh, what do I look for? So uh, here is your array A. Which array do we form out of it? Huh? Uh, so, well, maybe it's enough just to form uh, A that consists of all x to the 40 when x belongs to, okay, so this is an array S, right? So we form an array that consists of all numbers to the power 40. Now, you have to see now whether you can find y so that this value is uh, somewhere here, right, for the, for the same x. Well, maybe even we don't need to, yeah, maybe we don't even need to. Go. How would you do it? Huh? So we can just go through the array rather than... So you go through the arrays through, uh, with x through the, uh, through the array. And you have to see now whether there is a y so that this holds. How do we do that? First, when we have to see whether something is in an array uh, what is kind of usual, what, what is uh, a given the bound n log n, so we sort the array. So we can assume, so we can sort s, and now uh, let x range over s, and what do we do now? How do we see whether there exists y? So for that particular value of x, this equality holds. So if I take the mid value of the midpoint of the array, and it turns out that the, the value for this particular y is larger than x to the 40, do I have to check for the larger values of y? No. You see, the crucial thing here is that this is monotonic in Y. It wouldn't work if it was, for example, minus here. So this is monotonic in Y. So I simply take an X, so we range with X through the array, and then we always look at the midpoint if the value for y being the midpoint of the array is too large, you don't have to check for the larger values of y because this is monotonic in y. If y is even larger, clearly, and it was too large in the previous value of y, of course, it would be um, too large for larger values. So now we can just do binary search. <coughs> Uh, with respect to y. So you understand how it works? It's a, um, you, the, you find the midpoint, right? And then you see if y is bigger than the... So if, if you could find the midpoint and compute for this given x and the midpoint of y, you see whether this is bigger or smaller than x to the 40. <coughs> so for given x, you will compute x to the 40, and you will take a mid y and compute uh, y to the 60 uh, plus x to the 20 
y to the 20 uh, plus 10. And if for this y, this is larger than x to the 40, taking even larger y's, uh, certainly it will be larger than that, uh, because this is monotonic in y. So binary search now allows you to see in log n many steps, uh, for each x, it takes only log n many steps to see whether you can find y so that uh, x to the 40 is equal to this expression. Okay, let's do now some greedy. Do you have any questions so far? So this is just a simple binary search. Okay, so you are given a bunch of tasks, each of unit duration. And for each task, you have a deadline. So you have tasks. Um, uh, P1, P2, Pn are uh, all of uh, unit duration, uh, unit duration of time needed to complete the task. <coughs> and for each task, you have the deadline D1, D2, up to Dn, and you have penalty P1, P2, up to Pn, that you have to pay if you don't complete the task by its deadline. You have to schedule the tasks in such a way that the total maximal penalty is minimized. The total penalty is minimized. How would you solve this problem? So here is your timeline, and here are your deadlines. D1, D5, D2, and so forth. And they are all integers, so you can think of the i's as uh, uh, integers, uh, right? positive integers. And for each uh, task, you have also penalty associated if you don't complete it by the deadline, by its uh, deadline. So. So the penalty is absolute, not relative to how much after. The no, penalty is if you complete it by the deadline, you don't pay penalty. Uh, if you don't complete it by the deadline, it doesn't matter how much you are over the deadline, you pay the same penalty. <coughs> this is approximately corresponds to, you know, when I borrow books from the library. <laughs> So, you do, would you do the earliest deadline first? Okay, so, but maybe the earliest deadline, the penalty is one penny. Right? And uh, doing the earliest deadline first, maybe it will uh, eventually, the early deadlines uh, will eat up all the space and then there will be something. Uh, um, what would be the best when you, this actually is such a important uh, procedure that it has a name of how to, how you do such things. Uh, so you, you would uh, sort the task by the penalty, and you want to get rid of all the, to make sure that all the most uh, expensive items are done in time. When will you do the most expensive task, kind of minimally restricting, would you do it first? Exactly, so the, how is this called in logistics? Huh? So the, the suggestion is uh, you do it uh, just before its deadline, uh, just in time, exactly. So you do, you sort by, so sort by penalty, 
and uh, do uh, each task as close to its deadline as possible. Right? Because just before its deadline, maybe you have several tasks uh, uh, or uh, the tasks, previous tasks, kind of the higher deadlines, right, um, might occupy this lot. So you do, you find the first, uh, the closest open slot that is as close to the deadline as possible. And this is called just in time. And in fact, greedy is the way to do it. Okay, here is another simple greedy that was a couple of years ago on the return. So you have, uh, this is actually quite representative of the building in which I live. So, you have a bunch of stalls. Yes? Will it improve? Did it improve the previous one or not? Okay, so what do you think? Do we prove that one? No? That it is optimal? Isn't it just wrong? Hmm? I don't think it works. It doesn't work? Oh. Just before the deadline? You can't do the most expensive ones first, right? The least expensive? You can't do the most expensive ones first. Uh, no, because maybe uh, there is... Uh, okay, you do the most expensive first, uh, and it happens, so here it is. Uh, and it happens there exists a job whose deadline is exactly uh, there. But you already placed the most expensive one there, and you block the slot uh, for the one whose deadline is uh, just here. You saw it decrease in memory. Right? So if you did, you see the point is, uh, say uh, this is the most expensive one is here, say this is a deadline, uh, uh, the deadline D2, and here is deadline D1, and uh, it happens that the penalty P2 is bigger than penalty P1. If you place it here, now you kill the possibility to do the, this job in time. Right? But if you do it just before its deadline, then you are kind of interfering with the smallest possible, you rule out, you block execution of as few as possible. Uh, essentially, you execute it as late as possible, so, so as to leave as many as possible open slots. Isn't it the case, though, that sometimes you might just not want to do a job at all? Well, yeah, of course, you don't do a job at all if there is no place, uh, right, if you have... So, say, assume the uh, D3's uh, deadline is uh, uh, also here, right? So you put it here, and then if you have sufficient number of jobs with that deadline, eventually you will run out of space, and then you cannot do them at all. So you always place it to the <coughs> closest, so if this is the deadline, but it's occupied, this is the deadline, but it's occupied, you look for the closest open slot, closest to the deadline, and this is where you execute it. Right? Because in this way, what is the idea? The idea is to execute it as late as possible, so that uh, as many deadlines remain free. Wait, what order do you consider tasks in? Sorry? What order do you consider tasks? In the, the order of uh, penalty. From the largest. Sorry? From the largest. From the largest, yes. Yes? Suppose you had <coughs> an extremely small task with a very early deadline and then a very, a very big <coughs> task. No, 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 all of the same duration, that's important. Ah, okay. ah. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Very good. 
it doesn't work if uh, scheduling, yeah, we will see later when we do dynamic programming what we do when, uh, uh, when the durations are different. Uh, but if they are all on, of the unit duration as we mentioned, uh, then you always place it as close to the deadline as possible, right? So that you rule out uh, as few as possible with earlier deadlines. Uh, yes? Okay, suppose then you had, say, 10 slots mm -hmm. before your deadline, but you had 50 tasks mm -hmm. that had that deadline. Mm -hmm. Is that really the way uh, So then you will be able to execute only 10 baby of them, and the rest you will have to pay the penalty because there is no possible, but simply there is not enough time to, but you make sure to execute them in the order of penalty by, and you do it as close to the deadline as possible so that as few earlier deadlines are blocked. Right? Think about uh, that uh, and you ask whether you have to prove so, try to justify, we will talk about this tomorrow. Try to justify yourself why this is an optimal solution. Okay, how about uh, this one? So, is it clear the solution? We just execute the task as close to, in the order of how much, it, uh, what is the penalty, as close to the deadline as possible. Okay, so here you have, 111 stalls, and because it's heavily raining, some of them are leaking. This is actually our apartment building, and this is my apartment here. And you need a bucket if you live there. Okay, so some of the stalls are leaking, and you have to put some cover over them. But you live in a strange country in which you are allowed to put only, say, 11 pieces of, as, of any length you want, but they can, they, there can be no more than 11 pieces. And you have to cover certain holes. How would you do it with 11 pieces so that the waste of material, namely, Covering what you didn't need to be covered is minimal. Mm, so you look for the largest um, open spots. So uh, if we basically would cover everything, and then we could like, split it up further and further. Very good. So uh, that's one type of solution. Let's do it both ways. So what uh, uh, this lady suggests is uh, cover the whole thing uh, from the first one that needs to be covered to the last one to be covered, cover them all with a single piece, right? And then you look for the largest gap and you excise it. And you keep doing that until you get um, 11 pieces, right? So this is just one piece. If you excise this part, you will get two pieces, uh, <coughs> and each time you excise the longest possible gap, right? Because in this way you save uh, most uh, uh, more of the most of material, right? How would you do it uh, in the other way uh, by fusing uh, things? Uh, if say you you have 20 uh, slots to cover and you cover them with 20 pieces, uh, but you are allowed to use only 11. How would you fuse the pieces together? Use the closest one. You will use the closest one until you end up with uh, 11 only. Do we have to prove that this is optimal? No. Nah. <laughs> it's obvious, right? <laughs> so but the point is, whenever common sense tells you that it works, you don't have to design proofs. Proofs are needed only when it is simply not clear that, um, uh, that your algorithm works. 
Okay, here is another one. I'm sorry, Alex. Yes. What if this solution seems obvious, but it's actually not? Well, the burden of the proof is that you you have to judge whether. So uh, yeah, that's actually very good. Uh, what if the solution looks obvious, but it is not obvious? So what you can then do is uh, you write your algorithm, and then you say, "You old stupid man, can't you see that this works?" <laughs> So, to play it safe, it's good to kind of give uh, some form of argument uh, um, for every solution. Don't worry, I won't give you problems that will be obvious, okay? <laughs> okay, let me see what... Okay, so how about this one? It's called... How is it called? It's a piling path. So you have a bunch of intervals. So you have one interval, and you know that it is completely covered by a bunch of shorter intervals. And you have to select as few intervals as possible so that, oh well, you have to select as few intervals as possible that still cover uh, the whole interval. How would you do this one? Um, could you start from A side, so have a left? Take the the one that from the ones that start at the start of the entire interval. Take the one that goes the furthest. Exactly. So you simply start with the left end, and among on the all of the intervals that cover the beginning of this big interval, you pick the one that goes the furthest, right? And then just do the same from that point. And then you remove, uh, so from that point, again, you look at all intervals that uh, cover this point and <coughs> that go as far as possible. Do we need a proof? Do it anyway. <laughs> you don't need a proof for everything. You see, it's hard to, uh, what I want to, do, to tell you is this. Uh, in the books, you often have proofs of trivialities, and then people think that proofs are used to show something trivial. Right? So when it is, OK, how about this? Uh, you are bored in Sydney, right? And uh, here is Canberra, where all the fun is. <laughs> <laughs> and you have a very small car with very small tank. And you have a bunch of gas stations from Sydney all the way to Canberra. And you want to stop as few times as possible. How would you solve this problem? When would you refill your tank? Quick, you refill it the last time that you pass a station where if you went to the next one, you'd run out. Exactly. So you always fill, refill at the uh, gas station uh, uh, that has the property that if you didn't feel there, you would have run out of uh, gas before that. Now, does this need a proof? <coughs> no. Are you happy now with that one? Perfect. Okay, so okay, I'll explicitly say, I have to just remember not, not to forget, I'll put, if I don't say, uh, I'll say if it's if, it, if you have to prove or you don't have to prove. Okay, so here is another greedy. So greedy is really, uh, most of the time, greedy is kind of rather simple technique. So, You have 
two sequences, A and B, okay? One, uh, sequences of letters, here is A, and here is a sequence uh, B that is shorter, okay? The question is, uh, you have to answer whether B is uh, a subsequence of A, not necessarily contiguous. Uh, how would you solve this problem? How would you determine? Essentially, I'm asking you, uh, is it possible to delete some of the letters of A and end up with B in the same order as they appear in A? How would you do that? Start it, the first letter in B, find it, the first occurrence in A, exactly. and mark so, that as taken, I suppose. Exactly, so take the first letter in B and find its earliest appearance. Then uh, take the second letter in B and find its earliest appearance that is after the appearance of the first letter. Right? Do we have to prove that if this works, if this doesn't work, simply B cannot be a subsequence of A? Yeah? You would tell us. No. I will tell you, but what do you think, really, honest to God? Hmm? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what if your A is something like A, A, B, C, and your B is A, B, A, A, B? Okay, so why don't you give me the sequence once again? Okay, so the, the string that you're... So the string is A, A, B, B, C, C. And... So, okay, put another A at the front of that. <laughs> okay, the pattern you're searching for is A, A, B, B. A, A, B, B. B. C, C. So take A and look for its first appearance. Take A and look for its first appearance that is after B where the first A was embedded. <coughs> then take B and look for the first appearance after the previous one. Take B and look for the first appearance and here it is. Ah, oh, so it doesn't have to be in order? No, no, they are in order but they're not necessarily contiguous. I see. Okay. Why does this uh, work? Well, if you didn't take the first one and it did work, of course you can always repoint it to an earlier one, right? Or you simply say, this is obvious, so, right? Which it is. So, okay, here is one that is uh, less obvious. So you have to write a paper about algorithms, right? <laughs> And uh, it's an extremely long paper. It's a tractatus algorithmicus. <laughs> and uh, you figure out you will need a hundred books. Some of them multiple times. But this university thinks with the tuition you pay, you can take home uh, only 10 books from the library at a time. No? If you pay more, maybe you get to take 20. So you kind of do a little bit of research and uh, you realize that this is, uh, you labeled all the books uh, and this is the order uh, of the books that uh, you will need them. No? And you want to minimize uh, the number of trips that you have to make to the library. How would you... <coughs> Can we sort the, uh, the book list? No, because this is the order in which... So you're writing a paper, and first you will need the, the first book, then the fifth book, the sixth book, and then again you will need the first book, right? But you can keep at home only 10 books 
how would you make sure that you minimize the number of trips to the library? Can you make a copy of the books when you get it? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to go to the library, you just go to this dodgy Russian website. <laughs> <laughs> I'm running that one. Oh, sorry? I'm running that one. <laughs> I can't tell you what to do. <laughs> so, could you just like, so is it, throw out the one which you need furthest in the future? How much do I? Very good. So, if you uh, have, if you if you need a book which you don't have, but which book do you return? And the uh, suggestion is you return the book that you will need furthest away in the future. So replace the book which you will need again for this in the future. So are you best off returning one book at a time? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, that's a very, very good, uh, very good, uh, uh, you know, actually it wasn't formulated in that way, and I didn't think uh, um, that's a very, very, very good question. In fact, <coughs> okay, you need the book, right? Um, does it make, is it better to return several books or just to replace? And just in eight books. Wouldn't you just take all the books? As many so minimize the number of trips to the library. Shouldn't you?